Father God, I do thank you, Lord, again, as we're just reminded of this season of the greatest gift of all, of you coming. Lord, you dying for, for us, you rising again. And God, the promise that we have that someday we will be with you. And God, I, I thank you for that promise. I thank you that your promises are sure, that God, you never fail. That God, as we, as we look at this passage tonight of the steadfastness of, of Daniel, God, that you would speak to our hearts. That God, we would be encouraged, convicted, whatever the case may be that we need to be, Lord, that you would speak to each one of our hearts through your word because that's what you do. And God, I just thank you that we have your word, that we have uh, these examples that we can follow, that we can, Lord, look at, that, that we can see your faithfulness and how much you love us, God. So I just praise you and I thank you and I want to give this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, this is probably one of the most well-known stories or passages in Scripture, Daniel chapter 6 of Daniel and the lion's den. And I, as I was studying this and as I was looking at it, you know, sometimes, I know that if you've been around church very long, if you ever went to Sunday school, I'm sure that you've went through this story, that we, it's one of those passages that we, that we learn earlier, one of those passages, because it is so powerful, but I think the danger sometimes of some of these passages that are so familiar, at least for me, as I'm reading my Bible, sometimes you'll come to a passage that you are real familiar with, and you just kind of blow through it. You just, okay, I know that story. I know what's going on. I don't really need to spend a lot of time here. But God wants to speak to us through this passage. God wants to speak to us each time we pick up our word. He wants to speak to us when we don't pick up our word as well. But when you pick up your word, God wants to speak to your heart. God wants to share with you. God wants to pour into you. And I think sometimes when we get passages that, again, that we are so familiar with that, that we don't really spend the time to maybe listen to what maybe God has to say to us through that passage and through the scripture. And it's always kind of a danger to, to do one of these passages, again, because it is so familiar. But as we look at this, we're going to see... Obviously, we, we're going to see what jealousy does, what vanity does, but we're also going to see what faithfulness does. And two of those we want to stay away from. But the one we want to embrace. And, you know, we, we're introduced to Daniel back, you know, as we've been going through the Old Testament and we've been looking at the deportation of Israel, of, of them being carried away into captivity. We're, we're introduced back in chapter 1 when Nebuchadnezzar sent and captured portions of his part of Israel, took them back, and we're introduced to Daniel there, of, of Daniel being taken into captivity, and him and his, the three. And, you know... We wouldn't have chapter 6 if we didn't have chapter 1. And you're going, really? But, <laughs> true. But <laughs> for a couple of reasons. But as we look at that, back in, in chapter 1, when, you know, Nebuchadnezzar said, I want you to go and I want you to capture and I want you to bring back the, the smart, young, good-looking guys. I would have been safe. So <laughs> I, I would have not been carried away. That would have been great. But, but he wanted to bring the, the cream of the crop. Said, bring them back. We're going to teach them in our schools. We're going to, to raise them up to, in our schools. And we have there that Daniel and Hananiah, Michelle and Azariah. And then as we know them better, because it's funny how 
Daniel was given a, a Babylonian name, but we refer to him as Daniel. But the other three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we always refer to them as that. And we, we see, but the key to that there was, is in chapter 1, verse 8, where it says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. That back when this young man went into captivity, back when he was a teenager, he determined in his heart at that time that he was not going to defile himself. And it goes on there to say in the food and the, and the wine and all of that of the, of the king's table. But I think it's deeper than that. It was much more than that. That Daniel decided and, and the other three there that they were not going to defile themselves. Even though they were taken captive, gone into captivity, going into a place where it would have been very easy for them to just fall into the culture, fall in and just go with the flow. And yet they determined in their heart that they weren't going to defile themselves, that they were going to stay true to the one true living God. And I think that's a very powerful message for you and I tonight. That if we're going to have the victories in our life that we see Daniel, that we see Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego have in their life, that we have to purpose in our heart way before time that we're going to not defile ourselves, that we're going to stay true to God, that we're going to seek God, that we're going to walk with Him, that we're going to let Him rule and control our lives, that we're going to give up control of our lives to him, to let him determine the outcome of our lives. And it's too late when the, when the trial comes. It's too late when, when those other things come. It has to be something that we purpose in our heart now that we're not going to go the way of the world, no matter the pressure, no matter what goes on, that we are going to Stay true to God. And that's why I say that without that in chapter 1 of him making that, that purpose in his heart, that this wouldn't, chapter 9 would not, or chapter 6, neither would chapter 9, but chapter 6 would not be there because this whole thing that we're going to look at tonight was caused, if you will, because of Daniel's faithfulness, of Daniel's dedication to his God, to Daniel standing firm in his conviction of the Lord. And we see leading up to this in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar that, that Daniel was, God gifted him to interpret the dreams and and, and to do the things that, that he did to bring him to this point. And I always loved the, the story of, of Nebuchadnezzar when he had the dreams and he, he brought his magicians and his wise guys in and said, first, you tell me the dream, then you tell me the interpretation, and if you don't, I'm going to kill you all because you're a bunch of phonies. You're, you, you know, and Daniel, God enabled Daniel to do that as as we know, as we follow through there. But, and so here we have Daniel. We're introduced as a teenager. At this time in Daniel's life, Daniel would have been in his 80s. This would have been, <laughs> Daniel was not a young man at this time. He would have been in his 80s. And so let's, let's look here at the, at the text. And let's kind of back up a couple of verses there to verse 30 of chapter 5. It says, that very night that Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. So we see that as Belshazzar was defeated, as now, as those kingdoms, as the dream Nebuchadnezzar had was, was taking place just as 
Daniel had said as God had showed Nebuchadnezzar and had done that, we see now that, that the reign of the Medes and the Persians are taking over at this time. And so just before that, obviously, you know, he, we, we know, if you know the story of, of him having the big party and, and pulling out the vessels that were taken from the temple and using them and the finger writing on the wall that basically said, you're dead. And so again, they called Daniel in. Daniel had, to, he says, you know, I'll put you third in command. And Daniel goes, ah, not a big deal, dude, you're dead. You know, just, but here we see that he's taken over and now he's setting up those, those governors, those lieutenant governors, those people to oversee the kingdom and answer to the governors. The governors obviously would answer to the king. So he's setting up his cabinet, if you will, setting up those, those people that are responsible, that he can trust to look over the kingdom, to take care of that. And we see here that Daniel is one of those, one of the governors, one of those three that, that were over the other ones. And that's interesting as Daniel, again, this Hebrew captain capture that is going to be one of the governors one of the the people that Darius puts over the kingdom that he has chose to to look over and then he says here in verse 3 then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Daniel was able to do and was faithful because he had an excellent spirit within him. The spirit of the living God. That God had given him the spirit because of his faith and because of that dedication. That same spirit as a believer that lives in you and I. That same spirit that we have, the same power that we have. As we look at, at Daniel, as we look at some of these Bible heroes, if you will, they were just men. They were just women. They were just human beings. But what set them apart was their dedication to their God. That what made Daniel do what Daniel did, what made Daniel able to, to perform and to do the things that Daniel was able to do was because, again, of that purpose that he made back when he was a young man. And Daniel's one of those guys that is very convicting to read because, as we'll see here, we don't find a lot of faults in Daniel. We don't have bad things written about Daniel as we do some of the other people. You know, the, the two that really convict me in the, in the scripture are, are probably Daniel and, and Joseph. You know, those two guys were pretty awesome. But not because of who they were. It was because of who their God was and them trusting in, in God, of them dedicating their life to God. And so, we see here that, that Daniel distinguished himself above those other guys because of his faithfulness to his God, which made him, ironically, faithful to a pagan king. That a pagan king said, this is a guy that I can trust. This is a guy that I can put my faith in. And as we read on, and as we'll see, as we, as we look through this chapter, it was no secret that Daniel was a seeker of God. That it was very open. It was, you know, and he, he, he talks about, you know, hey, you're God. That, that this was something that Daniel did. And that distinguished him above the others. And tonight, as I look at that, as a Christian filled with the Spirit of God, my actions, my work ethic should distinguish me above others. I should be the best person in the workplace because of my God, because of who I am 
in God, that I should be one that can be trusted, that one that can be, that they don't have to worry about. And, and again, as I, as I read this and as I look at this, I get pretty convicted, and so I hope you do too, because I hate to be convicted alone. <laughs> but, but really, I mean, when you, when you look at that, are we really purposed in our heart that we're going to be what God wants us to be? that we're going to be the very best, that we're going to do what God wants us to do. And that doesn't mean you're going to, to be the CEO. That doesn't mean any of that, but you should be the best at whatever you're doing, the most dedicated at whatever we're doing because of who we represent as a Christian. I think Daniel certainly understood that principle, that as he was open about his God, about serving his God, that he knew that, guess what? He was representing, as people looked at him, they were judging his God by, by him. And as we tell people we're Christians, people are going to be looking at us and saying, hmm, is there a difference in them? Is there a difference between them because of who they are? I, I certainly hope that's the case. And as we do that, that doesn't always make us real popular. As we'll see, it didn't make Daniel real popular. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Man, I want people to be able to say that about me. I would love to be, for people to be able to say that about me. That as Daniel was rising, these other guys were getting jealous. They were envious. And instead of, okay, we need to step up our game. No, we need to bring him down. We need to destroy Daniel because he's making us look bad. Daniel was that guy I hated in school when they graded on a curve. Because <laughs> Daniel got hundreds. Daniel, if you could just get a 75, it'd make my 50 look so much better. <laughs> but no, but, but, in, but instead of, you know, so often in those things, instead of stepping up our game, we want to bring those people down to our level. And certainly, instead of studying harder, I just wanted them to not do as good. But that's what jealousy does. And it said they sought to find fault concerning the kingdom. Now again, this Daniel had been in Babylon for 70 years almost. He'd been there a long time. And yet it said through all of that, through all the background checks, the FBI investigations, all of those things, they couldn't find anything to bring a charge against him. They couldn't find anything of all of that time to find a charge against him. Why? Because he was faithful. Then these men said, we shall, find, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. We know how to get to this guy. We'll go after him because of the law of his God. And so, these governors and satraps throng before the king. You can just see this, this entourage coming before the king. And said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. Now, that's flattery, but that's, that's also a very common greeting for a king. We'll see Daniel actually use it later on in the chapter. But here are these guys, oh, king, you're so great. King, you're, you're so wonderful. Live forever. All the governors 
all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So here they come. Now, Darius could have looked around and said, I don't think all the governors, where's Daniel? I don't, there seems to be one missing here. Be careful when someone tells you how great you are. They're probably lying. Just saying. <laughs> when, people, when people come and start flattering you and telling you how great you are, you know, I don't want to fall into that trap of them of thinking that I'm how great somebody says, and I sure don't want to think how bad they think I am. Because they're going to... You know, and they're, they're, they come in flattery. You know, so often people will come in and, oh, this is just the greatest. This, and those are the people I'm going, okay, we need to watch out. Because <laughs> those are the people that are going to probably dislike us pretty quickly. Oh, this, this is, you guys are so great. You're, you're so much better than, okay. No, we're really not. And so I think you've got to be careful of listening to the press either way. But here these guys come and they go, Oh, King, you're, you're so awesome. For 30 days, no one should talk to anybody. Basically, they, you know, that they, they shouldn't do anything except for you, Oh, King. That no petition for God or man, that they should just look to you. And if not, throw them into the den of lions. O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. So these guys had this all lined out, had this all made up and said, King, all you got to do is sign it. You know, and the king's going, yeah, I am pretty cool. Great idea. Everybody should, you know, and part of this, maybe they were, you know, I mean, I, I don't know that we had all the dialogue here between them, but they're maybe saying, you know, King, you're just kind of taking over some of this. And if you really want to establish your kingdom, if you really want to want people to know who's in charge and what's going on here, you need to establish this and you need to have everybody look to you. You need to have everybody come to you at least for 30 days, so that they know who the man is. They know who's in charge. They know what's going on. But he signed it. You know, and, and again, be careful, because sometimes people will bring things and say, here, you just got to, you know, and certainly in all the years of ministry, I've fallen into some of these things, of, you know, and then you go, oh, no. Why did I say okay to that? Or why did I fall into that thing? Without praying about it, without thinking about it, without looking at all the angles of this, the king just said, hey, you guys are right. I'm pretty cool. Good idea. Sign the decree. And I love Daniel. I love his response to this. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed... He went home and in his upper room with his window open towards Jerusalem he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Daniel said, I'm not changing. You can have your decree. I don't care what it costs me. I'm following my God. I don't care. It wasn't like he didn't know. It wasn't like he didn't know they were watching. He didn't, it wasn't like he didn't know they were setting a trap for him. It was just that I don't care. I'm going to follow God. 
I'm going to do what I've been doing, and I'm not going to change. And I'm going, you know, Daniel could have done a lot of things there. He could have simply said, okay, I'll put this on hold for 30 days. But he's going, I'm not going to compromise my walk or my belief. He could have closed the window and the shades. He didn't have to. But yet he said, no, I want the world to see the power and the dedication I have to my God. And as he knelt there, he humbled himself before the Lord. And as you look further, I believe we can see some of his heart and his prayers because I think it's verse chapter 8 that it talks about as Daniel was praying as he was confessing his sin and the sin of his people and he was praying for Jerusalem that God spoke to him there but I, I believe that that is, was Daniel's custom that he knelt before the Lord and he cried out to the Lord and confessed his sin and the sins of his people. And he did it towards Jerusalem, which would have been his custom. And we can see why that was, because if you look back, when Solomon built the temple, and when Solomon dedicated the temple and his prayer of dedication, he talked about when my people, when your people have sinned and they're taken away, and they pray towards the temple that God hear them, forgive them, restore them. Daniel knew his word. And as you go through Daniel, you know he knows his word because he was reading his word and said, hey, man, our 70 years are about up. Wow, this is, this is good stuff. But he believed the word and he said, I'm going to pray towards the temple because the temple was a big deal. Why? Because that was the dwelling place of God. That's where they went to meet with God. And we know that as Solomon prayed and as Solomon dedicated that temple, that the presence of God inhabited that place. Now we know that, that God is everywhere. We know that we don't have to go to the church. We don't have, but our heart needs to be that God, I'm going to humble myself before you. And it's not that we have to get in a kneeling position. I think sometimes maybe we, we do. I think sometimes, but it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of kneeling our heart and ourself before the Lord. And, and if you kneel, if you don't, no big deal. It's who we're praying to. And I like that because, you know, we don't see a lot of faults in Daniel, but obviously Daniel did. Why? Because it said as he was confessing his sin and the sins of the nation. So, you know, and I think that's always a good, good place to start. God, I know that I've blown it. But as he was doing that, and as he knelt there before the Lord to pray three times a day, as was his custom, that Daniel sought the Lord three times a day here in this room. Now, I believe that we certainly need to have those specific times of prayer we're told to pray without ceasing and I know that we can, you know, that we can pray any time and that we should. But I think that there's those special times that we need to dedicate to the Lord. That we dedicate to spending that time with God. That we are diligent in spending that time of, of confessing our sins, of, of humbling ourselves before the Lord and listening to our Lord. And Daniel wasn't going to change that no matter what. He was going to make sure that he kept that up. 
Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying, imagine that, and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man without, within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered and said, The thing is true. According to the law of the Medes and Persian, which does not alter. Find it interesting <laughs> that the laws of the Medes and Persian, that when a decree was made, the king had obviously had the power to sign and to ratify that decree, but he couldn't rescind it. That this was law. And so, it cannot, it cannot be changed. And so, they said here, so they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, let's, let's make sure you know that, does not show due regard for you, O king, for the decree that you have signed but makes his petition three times a day. And when the king, and the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. I find that interesting. He wasn't angry with Daniel, he had realized at that point, I've been set up. I have been had. These guys set me up because this one that I love, this one that I trust above everybody else, now I have no power but to do what the decree says. Be careful. Be careful when people flatter you when you make decisions, when you look through those things, because here this king's going, man, now what am I going to do? It says he labored. He sought, how, how can I change this thing? And he couldn't. And he couldn't. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, knowing, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king established may change. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. I'm thinking the king's going, I hope that's true. Now maybe the king possibly and more than likely had heard about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That how they had refused to compromise as well and how God had delivered them from the furnace. And he's going, Daniel, I, I really... I really hope that God's going to do that for you as well. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signet of his Lord, and the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No musicians were brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. So here the king is. He's bummed. He's stressed. He's getting no sleep. He's gone, I don't want any entertainment. I'm just, I'm really, I'm really upset because I have done this thing to Daniel because I have listened to these, these men. And it says he rose early in the morning and he went to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lament, 
lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to deliver, to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel, I love it. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. <laughs> king, it's cool. I'm good. Everything's all right. That is so cool. The king, as it talks with a lamenting voice, I don't think, as the king said, God, I sure hope God can deliver you. I don't think he had a lot of faith that God was going to deliver Daniel. And I love Daniel here. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Here the king, because of him making a bad decision of falling to the flattery of these men, falling into that trap of vanity, falling into that trap of these men, spent that night tormented. Daniel spent it with Jesus. Daniel laid his head on a line, used him for a pillow, and had the greatest night of his life, I believe, because of his faithfulness. And it wasn't, oh, king, I'm so great, but my God sent an angel because I was found innocent. Our God is going to take care of us. The thing that I find in this passage is that we can trust our God. And I think Daniel, you know, we don't hear Daniel fussing and fighting and, and having to be drugged to the lion's den. I think he willfully walked to the lion's den, went in, and I think he had the same attitude that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told the king there. Hey, my God can deliver me. If he does, cool. And if he doesn't, cool. We win either way. You know, the beauty of being a believer in Jesus Christ is death has no hold on us. Is that we know, we have that assurance that the world, Jesus even said, he said, don't fear those who all they can do is take your life, but fear the one who can take your life and send your soul to hell. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear the world. We don't have to fear any of the consequences of those things. Because if this would have went the other way, oh well, Daniel's with his Lord. And that's the assurance that you and I have, that God's going to deliver us. God's going to take care of us because of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we have that assurance. Yeah, we're going to celebrate his birth here in a few days. Tonight, we're going to celebrate his death and resurrection as we share in communion here in just a few minutes, as we remember what the Lord has done for us. And I want to go into this tonight realizing the faithfulness of our God. Because the cool thing, yeah, Daniel was a faithful guy. But you know, our word tells us that even if I am unfaithful, God remains faithful. And that can be good or bad. Because guess what? God's going to be faithful to judge those who reject him as well. But God's faithful to his people. That as a believer in Jesus Christ, the same spirit that Daniel had, we have. That we don't have to give in to the temptations of the world. We don't have to give in to what the world has to offer. 
that we can hold on to the fact that our God loves us, that, the, that our God wants the very best for us. And what a great night Daniel had as he spent that time as God delivered him. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he believed in his God. And again, I know that this story is so familiar to most of us. And I know there's nothing new about what I've said tonight. But I hope that it penetrates our heart that we need to be faithful. We need to determine in our heart that we're not going to defile ourselves with the things of the world. That we're not going to let those things get in our way of serving our God, whatever the cost, whatever the cost may be. That we won't give in to flattery. We won't give in to that vanity that we all fight. That we wouldn't be those that are jealous of those that God is raising up. But we would be content with where God has us, with what God's doing. That we're faithful to Him and letting God take care of us. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lives, lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Our sin doesn't only affect us. These guys... Their whole family was destroyed because of that. And that really speaks to me as a, as a dad. That my actions are going to affect my family. And I really believe that, man, as God has given us that command to be that spiritual leader, that leader of our home, that when we do that, God is faithful. And if I choose to not do that... God is faithful. But that's going to affect those around me that we don't sin in a vacuum, that our decisions have effect on those around us. And that really, you know, just really spoke to me that, wow, I need to be that faithful one so that I am that positive influence. I'm that positive on those around me, not one that brings them down. So tonight, as we, as we close this, as we get ready to, to take communion, I, I just hope that each one of us searches our heart and say, God, I, if I haven't, I want to make that tonight, that I am going to dedicate my life 100% wholly to you, and I'm going to follow you no matter what it costs and just see the glory of God in your life. See what God is able to do in you and through you as you're faithful to walk with him. Let's stand up and pray.